Hi friends, I'm Father Kerry Walters, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on the ABC Boys. I was recently asked a very good question. Why is it that Latin for so many centuries was the official language of the church? And why is it, as a matter of fact, that Roman documents that come from the Vatican, such as papal encyclicals, are still written in Latin, even though Latin is a dead language? It's a good question, because you would think that the official language of the church would have been either Hebrew or Greek. The New Testament, of course, is written in Koine Greek, and the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. So why weren't either of those languages adopted? Well, to begin with, of course, Greek was adopted by the Eastern Christian Church. It was the Western Christian Church that clung to Latin. And the historical reason for that is easily enough said. When the Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire with the Edict of Milan in the year A.D. 313, uh, Christians throughout the empire were empowered to uh, practice their faith uh, openly and without fear. And as a consequence, they just naturally began to adopt the language of the empire in publicly uh, expressing their faith and in public worship. As the Roman Empire began to disintegrate, and as the institution of the church began to build up, bishops, who again spoke the language of Rome, began to replace uh, Roman secular civil servants and bureaucrats and governors. And so the language that those civil servants and bureaucrats had spoken, Latin, was once again just easily adopted by the bishops and church leaders who took their place. So it actually was the consequence of Constantine recognizing the church and then going out of his way to make Christianity the at least unofficial official religion of the empire that led to the widespread use of Latin, both in the early church and throughout centuries. In fact, Latin continued to be the vernacular in which Christianity uh, expressed itself until the Protestant Reformation, when Martin Luther and other Protestants uh, finally began to say, enough is enough. We need to express our faith in, uh, in the language uh, of the people who come to worship with us so that they can understand what we're saying. This clinging to Latin as the official language of the church, and indeed as some uh, people uh, said, uh, clinging to it because it's the language uh, in which God speaks, um, created a tradition of great beauty, some of the most beautiful hymns and prayers that have been passed on to 21st century Christians were, of, co of course, composed in Latin. Some of the greatest theological works, Augustine's works, Thomas Aquinas's works, were composed in Latin. Latin is an extremely eloquent language. But the downside of clinging to that language was exactly what the Protestant reformers uh, saw. It began to be less and less well understood, not only by people who came to churches to worship at the Mass, but even by monks and nuns and clerics. By the time the 10th century rolled around, it was not uncommon for monks in monasteries and nuns in convents and perhaps even secular priests in villages to really not understand the Latin that they chanted during the Eucharist or while they were in choir. But it was considered to be very important that the Latin be pronounced correctly, that the prayers and the psalms be said and chanted correctly. There was actually, uh, in popular tradition around this time, the belief in a demon, Titivulus, who would collect all of the dropped syllables that monks uh, uh, forgot in choir 
and put them in a bag and that this bag would be weighed in the last day of judgment against the monks and the nuns and the priests who had dropped the syllables to start with. In other words, not pronouncing the prayers and the psalms correctly, so the belief went, somehow invalidated the psalms and the prayers and would be held against the people who had uh, mispronounced them. Well, in order to do something about this uh, problem, um, children began to be uh, raised if they were uh, destined for uh, a cloistered life or even a priestly life, they began to be raised not so much to actually learn how to read and speak Latin fluently as to pronounce it correctly. Uh, they were trained with horn books, Abe Che Darium, uh, the horn book was called, in which they were first taught to recognize Latin letters. And then they were taught to pronounce the individual uh, letters of the alphabet correctly. And then they would move on to correct pronunciation of syllables. And then they would move on to correct pronunciation of words. And finally, to correct pronunciation of entire phrases. Often without even the slightest idea of what the words and phrases actually meant. These young men who were trained in this way were called abecedari, uh, the ABC boys. And for at least a couple of centuries, if not longer, they were the boys who grew up to be the men who populated monasteries and who served as priests uh, in uh, village and city churches. Please don't misunderstand me. This isn't to say that all of the clerics in these centuries were illiterate. They certainly weren't. Some of the greatest medieval theologians and philosophers thrived in these centuries. But it certainly is the case that they appear to have been exceptions to the rule. So this is what happened when the church clung to a language that was increasingly misunderstood and not learned. Um, people who should have been the spiritual guides of the culture in which they lived were reduced to mouthing uh, phrases uh, that they didn't understand and hence couldn't help listeners understand, uh, couldn't help listeners absorb the spiritual depths behind the phrases. I think that the ABC boys, the story of the ABC boys, offers us in the 21st century a really good lesson. What we want to do, of course, as Christians in the 21st century, is to uh, pass on the tradition that we were uh, uh, given uh, as young people. We want to continue the golden thread of Christian spirituality and theology and philosophy and faith that was handed to us. But we want to do it in ways that will speak to the generation that follows us. What we do not want to do is to cling to metaphors and theologies that may simply no longer thrive, that may no longer speak to younger generations, the generations that come after us. If we do that, what we might be doing is simply repeating a similar kind of move that the ABC boys did. We pass on sounds uh, that really signify very little to those people who hear them or read them. I'm Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time.